Thank you for tuning in. Our project title is The Catholic School Advantage is Culturally Sustaining Pedagogy. My name is Maria Kaur. Um, I teach high school English out in Oakland, California. My name is Colin Gordon and I teach social studies and writing at the middle school level in Oklahoma City. My name is Hannah Kemper. I teach high school math and theology in Tucson, Arizona. And my name is Hannah Kennedy and I teach high school English in Brownsville, Texas. So to get us started, we have an overview of where our presentation will go. We'll start with definitions of the two concepts that make up our argument, culturally sustaining pedagogy, and then the Catholic social teaching and Catholic school advantage, which will include the history of Catholic schools, Catholic social teaching and its role in Catholic education, and then the Catholic school advantage. From there, we'll get into the meat of our argument, how the Catholic school advantage is culturally sustaining pedagogy, and then from there, we'll move into applications of CSP in Catholic school classrooms, so what this might look like for teachers on a day-to-day -day basis. So first, we're starting with culturally sustaining pedagogy. And just to begin, we have a definition of culture, sort of to ground where we're going and our discussion of CSP. So according to this definition, culture is the framework for human life that consists of people collectively using all the resources in their environment to achieve. It's part of all human groups. It's learned, shared, and regulated by political, legal, and social systems. It's socially transmitted, represents both external, so observable behaviors, and internal, inferred traits, aspects of an individual, and is an abstraction of people's knowledge and beliefs about themselves, other people, and the world. So this is a very broad definition, but that shows us how foundational culture is and why CSP is going to be important. So with this definition, there's three key points that we wanna highlight. The first is exactly what I said before, that it's broad, it's part of all human groups. There's no escaping culture. The second key point that we wanna highlight is that culture is learned and shared. So we see other people acting out culture and they sort of share it with us. And that bleeds into this part that it is socially transmitted, that it comes from other people. We watch, we learn, we take it in. And then the last piece is that culture has to do with beliefs about ourselves. So how we think of ourselves, how we think of other people, and then how we think of the world. So hopefully you're already thinking about how this applies to students in our classrooms, that it sort of underscores how they think about their own identity, how they interact with their peers and their teachers in the classroom, and then how they sort of encounter the ideas that we bring in and share with them, their approaches to that, their understanding, how they grapple with those concepts. So moving from this broad definition of culture into culturally sustaining pedagogy, we have a definition here that it is the seamless integration of students' cultures in teaching practices and curriculum. And even beyond this, culturally sustaining pedagogy really at its core seeks to interrupt social inequities. So it takes students' cultures and incorporates that into the curriculum, into the classroom environment, and it seeks to take those cultures, those students, and not make them objects in the classroom, but subjects, and so that they can take that and really sort of bring it out into the world. And that leads to our second point on this slide, that culturally sustaining pedagogy is necessary to meet the needs of the diverse students that we serve in Catholic schools. So with that, again, just to sort of reiterate its importance, culturally sustaining pedagogy, according to Geneva Gay in this paper, is empowering, transforming, and validating, especially from students from historically invalidated cultures. So culturally sustaining pedagogy, originated from Gloria Ladson Billings, culturally relevant pedagogy where she worked with African-American students and bringing their culture into the classroom to sort of help them understand the world around them, their place in it and how they can sort of go forth and disrupt social inequalities using their culture and understandings of their identity. And that has been shown to be a really powerful piece in making curriculum meaningful and relevant for students. To begin diving in, we're going to first look at Catholic social teaching 
and then the Catholic School Advantage, uh, just to see how these two are tied together and then lend themselves to properly implementing CSP into the classroom. So to begin, just a very brief note on the history of Catholic education. Just three main points here. Uh, firstly, that Catholic education, though it has always existed in our country, um, it really started to grow in the 1800s in response to immigration, um, particularly because um, the Catholic school system served as a space for the preservation of ethnic and religious traditions of Catholic immigrants. Um, so really there was a, a big protective feature um, over, over culture there. Um, so today, there, the United States is home to 8,000 Catholic schools. Um, that number is, is fluctuating, of course, but um, so that just kind of shows that it covers a lot of ground and that there is still a call for the preservation of different cultures around our massive country in the Catholic school system. So Catholic social teaching in Catholic education. Catholic Social Teaching, here on out called CST, um, is a series of guidelines that teach about building a just society and living lives of holiness amidst the challenges of modern society. There are seven main themes or pillars, if you want to think of it like that, to CST. I'll focus on five today, but just to run through all seven quickly, uh, the first is the life and dignity of the human person. Second, call to family, community, and participation. Third, rights and responsibilities. Fourth, the option for the poor and vulnerable. Fifth, the dignity of work and the rights of workers. Sixth, solidarity. And seventh, care for God's creation. So dive in, we'll first take a look at the life and dignity of the human person. What that means in CST is that in order to have a moral society, we must uphold the dignity of each individual. Um, for Catholic education specifically, that looks like caring for the individual students in front of us, um, thinking of them not merely as academic minds, but as persons full body, mind, and spirit. Um, and so this naturally includes students from all cultures, backgrounds, and ability levels in our own classrooms. The second theme we'll look at is the call to family, community, and participation. For CST, the definition is to seek the common good of society in order to uphold the dignity of all society's members. So you can already see how this relates back to our first theme, um, but now it's kind of looking at it on a broader scale on that community level. So in order for us to foster community in Catholic education, we must acknowledge the experiences that our students bring into the school with them acknowledging that that meso system, um, that their, their family and their church lives um, do affect their school lives as well. So this helps us to um, be more attentive to um, our, our students and to attend to their different needs um, in respecting their communities outside of school. The third theme is rights and responsibilities. All people have human rights and we have the responsibility to uphold those rights for our neighbors. As Catholic educators, we have a particular call to this. We have a responsibility to uphold the rights of all of our students. Um, we can think of our own classrooms as intimate moral societies. We can think of our schools as broader moral societies. Um, and we can see that we have a really key role um, in, in fostering those moral societies. The fourth theme is the option for the poor and vulnerable. CST says that Jesus tells us we need to prioritize the needs of the poor and vulnerable. Um, and again, as Catholic school educators, we have a special responsibility to care for our students, um, particularly those who have been marginalized by broader society. Again, thinking about their backgrounds and experiences outside of the school building, um, honoring that and fostering kind of that safe moral space for them within our own classrooms. And finally, the last theme that we're going to be looking at is solidarity, um, where all people are a part of one human family. So application to Catholic education here is that we do not discriminate um, in, within our school communities. 
particularly among our students, right? We're serving all of our students with the same dignity and respect, not in spite of their backgrounds, but um, in light of them, we're, we're involving that and, and honoring that in our own classrooms. The Catholic School Advantage honors um, behavioral and academic benefits. Um, just a few things to take note of here is that the Catholic School Advantage, according to research, uh, behaviorally um, says that it has really positive effects on self-discipline. So students who attend Catholic schools are typically less disruptive than their counterparts at public or private schools. Um, those same Catholic school students tend to show greater self-control and self-discipline um, when it comes to their academic work and their conduct uh, within the school community. Thinking more on that academic side too of the Catholic School Advantage, uh, Catholic school students typically have higher academic achievement. Um, students um, tend to have increased graduation rates, uh, particularly those um, from African-American and Latinx backgrounds. Um, so again, that's, that's honoring how Catholic schools incorporate different cultures and support um, typically marginalized peoples. Um, through the education system. And then the last academic benefit to note from the Catholic School Advantage is that educational attainment is less influenced by socioeconomic status within the Catholic school system. So we can see that there are behavioral and academic benefits to Catholic education. Um, and we really credit that to the implementation of Catholic social teaching um, kind of, again, fostering that moral society within the Catholic school, um, giving, giving that space there. So with that, our primary argument is that the Catholic school advantage, yes, it honors uh, behavioral and academic advantages, but really it's that we are able to implement CST so that we can better attend to the cultural backgrounds and differences of our students. So with that, we say that the Catholic School Advantage truly is the opportunity to implement culturally sustaining pedagogical practices in our own classrooms on a regular basis. Now that we've defined culturally sustaining pedagogy and we've talked about how that's implemented into Catholic education, we wanted to give you some practical applications of how you can implement culturally sustaining pedagogy into Catholic school classrooms. First, I'm going to discuss how CSP can be incorporated into theology classrooms. Um, one example, and these are meant to be very concrete, practical examples. Um, so one example is to compare the plight of the Israelites to the struggles of African Americans and other ethnic minorities. So tying in, um, I know last semester I taught about um, the Israelites and how they formed a covenant with God and how that meant that they were met with various struggles along the way. So tying that into how have other marginalized groups experienced this on their own as well. Secondly, um, we can unpack the implications of suffering, of the suffering of Christ um, on the suffering of other minority groups. So comparing and contrasting Christ's life to those of minority groups. Thirdly, we can talk about if Christ's suffering is redemptive, what does that say in our society today about suffering? And how are we upholding um, the rights of other people as we talked about with um, rights and responsibilities in CST? Finally, um, we can compare the suffering of Christ to um, those experiencing police brutality. That's more of a modern day um, thing that we're seeing in, in our society. Um, and we can make connections to, for example, the death of George Floyd. Um, and we can compare this all back to things that we're learning in the theology classroom. So these are incorporated into the curriculum. They're not separate from it. Moving into science. Um, so a couple of applications here. We can discuss genetics in the, cult in the context of other cultural groups. Um, so for example, we can talk about the prevalence of sickle cell disease among African people and how this affects their quality of life. Um, and just how these groups are really affected by genetics that maybe we don't experience here in the United States as much. 
Um, then we can discuss chemical reactions in the context of prescription drugs. And we can lead this into talking about healthcare and talking about different ethnic minority groups and their access to healthcare, whether it be because of location where they're situated and access to doctors or whether it be because they're immigrants um, and they're not able to access healthcare in the same way that US citizens are. Some mathematics applications we have. Um, in my statistics class last year, I had my students collect and analyze data based on the human dignity topic of their choice. A few of the options were abortion, human trafficking, and immigration. Um, but the, the key point of this was to analyze data and to make connections and really see for themselves what these societal implications are. Um, another way to incorporate this into math and more of an algebra class would be to apply functions or exponential growth to topics like immigration or poverty um, in other countries or disease, for example. Um, finally, a few other STEM applications we have. Um, this year in my coding class, I plan to have my students analyze data um, from immigration patterns. Um, I teach in a primarily um, Latino school and a lot of my students are Mexican immigrants or their families were. Um, we can also look at in light of COVID-19 pandemic, we can look at illness among unvaccinated populations. Um, and then also in an intro to engineering class, you could have students create engineering drawings of a homeless shelter or a water filtration system and then talk about who these would benefit in their local community and also more broader worldwide connections. We're going to continue with some ELA applications. Um, there are a lot of opportunities for incorporating culturally sustaining pedagogy um, when it comes to English and language arts. So firstly, with English, one really great way is just to uplift model text from diverse writers. Some excellent examples include Esperanza Rising, A Long Walk to Water, and There, There. Those are all great novels, but really anything um, that comes from outside of the traditional canon can be a great thing to include, especially if the author of the text looks like the students in your classroom. Um, composing written arguments that tap into sociopolitical consciousness is key. One thing we talked about when it comes to culturally sustaining pedagogy is that it is good to examine systems of injustice that are still happening in the country as well as historic ones. Um, so kind of looking at some different examples of what that would actually be like. So again, our goal is to provide concrete examples, would be having students write about the histories of their families, the histories of their communities, as well as maybe writing um, letters to editors, things of that nature, um, just considering systematic and systemic injustices in their writing. Additionally, allowing students to use their authentic voice in their writing is key. So if you have um, a lot of Latinx students, for example, you could have writing assignments where students are encouraged or allowed to write part of their poem in English and then maybe part of their poem in Spanish and kind of incorporate um, their own language in their writing and allowing that to be authentic and to um, kind of reflect the language that they would use in ho at home and in their communities. So moving on kind of to literature, and again, as writing, English class, and literature are so similar, there are going to be some overlap here. But in literature, it's great to allow students to read text that includes a diverse group of characters written by a diverse group of authors. Um, very important, very um, good thing to do. Some of those examples that I mentioned in the English section apply here as well. Knowing that text can be presented in multiple languages is key as well. Um, similar example, if you have a lot of Spanish speaking students, you could have um, like a poetry unit. This is something I did and I had poems in English and then I would have the poem um, with the Spanish translation underneath. You could also focus on doing a unit where you're reading um, poetry or some other form of writing specifically from um, the community where many of your families are from. Also, I think that another um, beneficial thing is to go beyond the traditional canon. So that can look like um, using diverse, um, using literature from diverse authors that includes diverse characters, as well as using things that we don't typically think of as literature, but that have um, equally valid um, content that you can use to analyze and draw inferences from and all of those things that we like to do in literature class. Um, so using different things 
such as brochures, memes, artifacts, really anything um, that is culturally relevant and culturally sustaining is a good way to mix things up. Some key social studies applications include taking action. So learning about systemic injustices is a great first step, but then actually taking action to educate other students about those injustices, as well as maybe um, educating the general public, similar to writing class um, where you're writing op-eds or things like that is a great way to show students that they have autonomy to change things and to actually take real and meaningful action. Emphasizing local history is key, especially because the local history of a community will oftentimes reflect the um, type of families who are in your school. You also may want to teach history, or you definitely want to teach history that is relevant to students, families, and communities. So again, if you have a lot of students from a particular background, it'd be great to include the history of students from that place. So in my school, about 10% of our student population is from Burma. So during our Southeast Asia unit, we made a point to go and study Burma, look at its geography, look at its history, look at some current events going on there. And that was really cool because we were allowed, um, able to innate, we were able to empower students to kind of become the experts on a subject matter. So instead of just having the teacher um, be in charge and then having the students be the objects of the learning, the students became the subjects and they became the experts. Our uh, last point when it comes to social studies is devoting special attention to the history of marginalized groups that may be overlooked in the study of the United States history or world history or whatever type of history or social studies class you are teaching. So like in US history, um, American Indian history is oftentimes omitted or oftentimes omitted after like 1900. So just bringing in narratives and bringing in perspectives of, of groups that are oftentimes overlooked um, would be an excellent place to start if you're trying to create a social studies classroom that emphasizes culturally sustaining pedagogy. So here are some of our references that I will flip through as I give just a little closing thank you. Thank you so much for listening to our group's presentation. We really hope that you learned a lot about the Catholic School Advantage, culturally sustaining pedagogy, and the confluence between those two concepts. Hopefully the um, applications for your classroom and our recommendations were helpful as well. We would be more than happy to answer any questions about this, and we're hoping this is a continuing dialogue. So this is certainly not us saying we are the experts on something, but it's saying here are some ideas. We would be happy to hear what you've been doing in your classroom and what you have been learning about. Um, we are eager to hear ideas that we could incorporate into our classrooms as well. So we hope to continue this. Thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you at our Q&A session. Thank you.